Okay, don't adjust your televisions, your phones, your laptop, whatever. No, the white balance is not wrong on your screen. Yeah, I'm just really sunburned. So uh, let's ignore the fact that I got blasted with sun during a baseball game. And uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and talk about what this video is about. Well, I did a video review of the Nikon Z6 II in comparison with the Nikon D750, which I still love, but uh, I love both. And I have migrated to the Z6 II. So in the comments below on that video, uh, I'll put a little link up there in case you wanna see that one. Uh, Heidi H uh, asked, hey, can you do a detailed review on your exact settings uh, that you use for the Z6 II? And I thought, Good idea. All right, so uh, Heidi H, this one's for you. Hey everyone, it's Mike here from Mike McGee Photography. Okay, once again, please ignore the serious farmer's tan. It's just, it is what it is, okay? So I am going to do a detailed video on the Z6 II settings that I use. And once again, I'm a portrait photographer, which is, so this is 99% probably someone like me who wants to do portrait photography. Um, these settings may help you. I also do some product photography as well, but uh, I kind of cater my settings on the Z Z6 II to portrait photography. So uh, the first thing I have to say is there is no right or wrong way to set up your camera. Each person sets things up differently. Each person uses their camera differently. So uh, this is never going to be one of those videos. I'm not that guy who says like, this is what you should do and this is what you shouldn't do and tries to do clickbaity stuff to say you're right or wrong. No, set it up any way you want. Um, I'm just going to show you how I set it up and maybe you might learn a menu or two in the settings that you hadn't noticed before or just learn something from this video and go, ah, I might try that just to see if it works for you. Try it, see if it works for you. If it doesn't, no worries. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and now I'm going to switch views on the camera to go ahead and show you the detailed back of the camera with the uh, menu system and then uh, we'll go from there. Okay, so before I jump right into the menu system, there's one special button that actually isn't in the menu system, and that's the monitor mode button that you can see right here on the side of the viewfinder. Well, now that we have a mirrorless camera, not a DSLR, we have an electronic viewfinder. Now we have some choices as to how that electronic viewfinder behaves and how we want the monitor on the back of the camera to behave as well. So I set mine to prioritize viewfinder. That is an option that allows the camera to act as closely as it possibly can to an existing DSLR. That's sort of what I'm used to, that's what I'm accustomed to, that's what I felt more comfortable. But you have some choices where it will just show the monitor or just show the viewfinder or you can have it set to automatically display and switch between the two so you have some choices here but I set mine to prioritize viewfinder all right I want to go in order with the exact menus that I have set up but first I want to show the exact button configuration that I used when I set up my z62 all right, so now we get into the custom controls. Now these are the controls that you will see and you can see that Nikon prominently displays exactly what button in yellow as you scroll through the options for what you have as choices here. Now um, I'm gonna go ahead and I'll show you what I did. So for this one, I actually selected this as the function button is the top item in the My Menu button. And what is that? Well, really, that is just the battery. I just go in and I, when I push and hold this, it just shows me my battery. I'm thinking about battery usage. And so when I push and hold this function button, I get to see not only battery A, but I have battery B because I have the optional battery grip attached to this uh, Z6 II. So let me go back to the menu system and we'll go ahead and I'm gonna go to the controls where we were. And so that is the custom controls. So how about function two? Well, it's back to the my menu button, but instead of being the top menu item, I made it the entire menu. So that allows me to do things like I always have to format my memory cards. So when I select this, you can see, um, I'm just gonna hit it actually, I'll hit function two. So I do format memory cards, the file number sequence, every now and then I wanna turn that off. If I do need to access that low light autofocus uh, feature, then turn it on, turn it off, I have that. If I wanna have the built-in auto uh, assist illuminator, the light that goes off, all these are quick access items that I can keep adding to. You, you aren't limited to just one or two. You can just have a nice scrolling list of items. So uh, I frequently use the menu especially for function button 2 which is a little hard to grip to and I don't need that many other items other than the dedicated buttons that are on the camera itself all right so let me go back to the menu system scroll through here go to controls 
How about for the AF on button? Well, that is the AF on button. I use that for back button focusing and that is by all means just set to AF on. Now, this is the focus point selector. Now, this is the joystick, the up, down, left, right, that allows you to toggle and find that focus point. Um, that's what I have that set to. Now, for this one, this is the same button. It's just that this is what happens when you push in on that button right there, the joystick button, the small joystick, I should say, that does not have the OK on it, but has the little uh, checkerboard kind of textured pattern, the smaller button. Now, if I push that in, I have that set to, to go with the flash enable or disable. This is frequently used in wedding photography, I'm sure, when the, you mix strobes and ambient light and you quickly want to go in and out of modes that have uh, flash or no flash. Now, I just like to push in on the back of that in case I need a scenario like that to turn off the flash entirely. And what's nice is you just have to push and hold that in and then you have a no flash situation. And once you release that, you're back to ambient light with um, the standard shooting. So I like to have that as an option and that's what I set this uh, particular button to. All right, so next up is the movie record button. Now I have to give a major shout out to Baron Silverton. Uh, he left a comment in my Z62 review video that I did up against the D750, and um, he left a comment and said, hey, you might wanna try doing this. I found that it's very beneficial. And um, I originally had my movie record button set to white balance, because if you notice on the Z62, there's no dedicated white balance button. Hmm. Kind of odd, there is on my D750, but hey, okay, no big deal. So I just mapped it to the record button. But he was like, hey, wait a second. You can actually map the record button to the autofocus modes, and that will allow you to, without moving your eye off the viewfinder whatsoever, you can toggle all your autofocus modes, and you can have that with your trigger finger. And I was like, let me try this. So I wanna give him again a major shout out because I love this, I think this is incredibly beneficial and let me show you how it works. All right, so now I switch things up. So I'm showing exactly what you see through the Nikon Z6 II viewfinder. This is exactly what you see. You can see all the settings for that I have set up. And now right now I have it on wide area people um, and I have it on AFS, the single point focus mode, okay? So in the past, if we wanted to toggle through, um, this wide area people allows me to just use that red box and then once I hit a focus selector, then you can see that Rob Deere, a uh, legendary uh, Brewers home run king and strikeout king is um, way in the back. You focus in over here inside that red box. It's going to look for a face. There you go. Willie McGee, classic, one of the greats. And you got Chris Pratt from uh, Moneyball is over there. Now, uh, if we want to go over here to Ichiro, the problem is, watch this. I'm going to do a search and it's that box. It has Bill King and Ichiro in the same box and it is only finding Bill King. So how do we solve that? Well, there's a couple different ways. You can do some subject tracking, you can do all kinds of things. But what I would typically do is I would just use single point focus. I would take it off wide area people. Well, in the past, we would have to go to the I menu and you can select wide area people, go over to the single point autofocus, select that, hit the I menu once again, take that off the screen, toggle over to Ichiro's face, lock focus, and boom, the future Hall of Famer is in focus and you're ready to fire. So now that works, but now by remapping the record button to toggle through your autofocus modes, this is a far more efficient and quicker way to do it without even taking your eye off the viewfinder. So as we saw in the past, I went through the eye menu, sub menus, and selected that. But now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna push and hold the record button down. Now I'm holding this down and you can see that AFS as well as the single point focus mode is now turned yellow. Well, what does that mean? That means if I use the main command dial in the back, I can toggle through single, continuous, or manual focus. So I can go through all these modes without ever taking my eye off the viewfinder and without going into those eye menu sub menus. Now, the other option is on the front dial. We have it on single point. Okay, so now if I use the sub command menu on the front, the little dial, I can toggle through the other autofocus modes and I can go ahead and I'm just gonna, it'll revolve all the way, it'll just circle right back around so you're not gonna like get stuck at the end and you can go back through and so I'm gonna go just to single point 
There's pinpoint, now we're at single point. Once you get a hang of these little icons, you'll know them by heart. But I'm pushing, I'm still holding that record button on the front, so my eyes not on the viewfinder, very quick. And uh, once I let go, I'm gonna go ahead and let go. Now it's locked in, now you're set, and I have single point mode. So I'm just gonna go ahead and select Willie McGee's face right here, bam, gets it. Let's go back to Scott Hatterberg, AKA Chris Pratt from one of the greatest movies of all time, Moneyball, and legendary A's broadcaster Bill King is now in focus. So oftentimes if a client, let's say, turns their face to the side, sometimes that auto face detect is not really gonna pick it up and it's gonna lose focus or it's gonna scramble to try to find focus. So I often use AFS depending upon how far away I am from the subject, but by remapping that record button to the autofocus modes, that is just a complete time saver for not having to toggle through the eye menu as you would in the past. All right, so next up is the lens function button. There's usually two buttons. Let's say you have like a 70 to 200 millimeter Z series lens, which I do. Uh, you can toggle these and set custom lens function buttons as well. I actually don't. I don't even bother going into that yet, I may down the road, but I primarily have my F mount adapted 85 millimeter lens on my camera almost all the time. So I haven't really gone into this in too much detail, so I just left those sort of at the default. But uh, here are my custom controls for my menu button. Okay, so here we are in the Nikon Z6 II menu system. And um, I'll go ahead and I'll just kind of breeze through all my menu options and I'll focus on some menus more than others because they're just frankly more important. So let's go through. Um, now you may see a playback folder and see Nikon Z62A. Why did I name it Z62A? Well, I have two Nikon Z62s. One is my backup. So I have one as NZ62A, the other one's NZ62B. Uh, it just helps to know which camera it came from. That's all. Um, now I'm gonna go back to the playback display options. I really only use the histogram um, when I'm playing back information. I want to use that arrow up. Uh, I know a lot of people enjoy highlights. Uh, I just don't really use it, so I just have it set to the histogram. So now we have your dual recording PB slot. So now we have image review. Now this one's kind of important because you can have it on. You can have it on for the monitor only or you can have it off completely. Now I have it on for monitor only. Now I do not like to see the image review in the viewfinder. I like to use the larger display on the back of the camera. Now I also don't like it when you take a picture and then as you have your eye still to the viewfinder, it's somewhat jarring if it's then going to just show you for let's say a second or two the image that you just took. Usually, you're still shooting and you want that thing to go away so you can compose your next shot. And it just kind of, I think it's counterproductive. So I have it on, but for the monitor only. Now we're gonna go through and uh, these are all pretty much your standard settings, rotate tall. I really don't use the slideshow or the ratings or anything like that. Um, so that's pretty much it for the playback menu options. All right, so moving right along, we're gonna now go to the shooting menu. Now there's quite a bit of stuff here. It's the same thing that I said before. I call this the NZ62A for storage. That's really what I was getting at. It's the same exact thing. Now here's one, file naming. Uh, a lot of times it just defaults to DSC. Everybody just leaves it at that. You know, add some professionalism to your file names in case clients see it. I am Mike McGee and from Mike McGee Photography, so I just use MMP, Mike McGee Photography. If you're Joe Schmo Photography, do JSP or something like that. I don't know, just to change it up to kind of give it a more individual look, especially if file names, if everyone's using the same file names and the naming structure, if you have a second shooter on a wedding, uh, you just wanna make sure that file naming is set. So I just leave it for MMP. Now we have your primary uh, slot selection. I have that set to the uh, CF Express card slot. Now uh, we're going to go to the secondary slot function. Now I always set it to backup. The dual slots of the Z6 II is a huge benefit over the Z6 and I uh, might as well use that because backup for me is more important than overflow because I never fill up uh, an actual memory card when I'm shooting. So that's cool. Now we're going to choose your image area. This is always FX for me. I never really go to the DX mode. I could see where some people would uh, when you want to toggle through and get a little bit more reach. That's not me. Uh, I always leave it on raw. I don't do raw JPEG. I'm just a raw shooter. I just shoot raw. So uh, do that. Now image size, we're going to have that as your raw large because now we can actually select different sizes of raw images. I just want the maximum amount of image quality, so I set that to raw 
large. Um, going back around, we're gonna go with the raw recording. Same thing, do you want a little bit of compression? I actually leave it on. Um, I think it's fine. I don't know of any you know, issues with uh, you know, lossless, compressed, I think it's fine. Maybe if people want to go uncompressed, you're just going to have more massive file sizes. And I've never really noticed any difference. So I leave that as raw compression on with the lossless compressed. So um, I'm going to go with the ISO sensitivity settings. I really, I have it currently set to ISO 400 or something, but I never really use auto ISO. Um, but what's nice is, since it has a dedicated ISO button on the front, you can just hold that down um, when you're shooting and then use the front subcommand dial to just toggle the on and off for this. So that's even more important why it's not really that important to have that uh, set to on or off because you can always tweak that while you're shooting. So now white balance. Now white balance, obviously you, you toggle different white balances for different types of shooting. So right now I just have it on auto too, but uh, that's what I'll get to in the I menu, the customization of the I menu later. But uh, for picture control, I usually just leave this as standard. I don't like it on auto. I don't like it on anything else. Um, I know I'm a portrait shooter, so you're probably thinking, hey Mike, why, why don't you put it on portrait? Well, that's a good question, actually, but um, usually what that means is that for portraiture, um, the camera is going to add little tweaks and maybe um, you know enhance uh, definition or add some contrast there. I really want the camera, I'm shooting raw, I just want it to have the most standard approach, so I leave everything as basic because I'm a control freak and I'd like a little bit more control in post-production because I either edit or import all my images into Lightroom anyway, I don't just give a, a native JPEG right from the camera. So that's just the way I shoot. So I leave it on standard. Now we're gonna go to the color space. I leave that as just the sRGB uh, active D lighting. Now, what's kind of cool about the Nikon's, a lot of people may or may not know this, in the bottom portion of your buttons on the back of your camera, um, there is a little magnifying glass that shows a plus and a magnifying glass that shows the minus. Now, if you look at the very bottom left of that, that same button doubles as a question mark. It has a little question mark there. Now, when you see certain areas of the menu system that have a question mark, like active D lighting, you might say, what the heck is that? Well, push the question mark on the back of your camera, and once you push that question mark and hold it down, a little information guide pops up so that instead of digging through your manual, it just tells you, oh, active D lighting improves the level of detail in highlights and shadows under high contrast conditions. Okay, well, uh, I don't need it, so I turn it off, but it's good to know. Then um, you can get some added information. So now, if you go to the color space, for example, you'll see that there is no little question mark there. Well, that's because it doesn't have any extra information, but when you go to active D lighting, boom, the question mark is there. So as you go through your menu options, just keep an eye out for that so you can get some added information because, uh, for example, long exposure noise reduction. I don't need that. I don't really do many long exposures except for when I'm in studio doing a little bit of a, you know, dragging of the shutter and some, some creative light play, but I still don't need a noise reduction there, so I just leave it off. We're going to go through high ISO noise reduction. It's off. Vignette control. I set that to normal. Uh, don't need anything. I could probably turn it off, but uh, I just leave it at normal. Uh, diffraction compensation. I actually leave this on. Auto distortion control is on. And flicker reduction shooting, I have it as off. Now, metering. This is a good one. Now, for different types of photography, you're going to meter your shots differently. But I'm a portrait photographer primarily, and I almost always leave it as matrix metering, almost always. Uh, so that's not one that I really have to toggle too much, but it is in my eye menu if necessary, but I leave it as matrix metering. Now, uh, we go to the flash modes here. That's really the pretty much standard. I leave the flash compensations. We have the focus mode that it's currently set to, so we can go through that later. Vibration reduction is typically always on. I love the vibration reduction. Uh, bracketing, I don't do a lot of bracketing. I used to do some crazy HDR stuff, and uh, I like that, but uh, I really don't use that. And multiple exposures, I don't do that in camera. If I'm gonna do a multiple exposure, I turn this off because I, I'm gonna do that in Photoshop or something and have a little bit more control over exactly how I do it. Why do it in camera? You can take two shots and then just do it in post, but that's me. Uh, HDR, I turn that off. Interval time shooting, it's off. But there are times where you can dig into menus and set this up. So there are times where I use this, but I just have it off for portrait shooting. And um, 
time-lapse movie don't use it but again great feature to have focus shift don't need it now silent photography now that's one where some shooters let's say you're a wedding shooter or maybe shoot newborns you might want to have that on um, I almost always leave it off I, frankly I leave it off all the time but I do put that as an option in my I menu so we'll get to that when I move on to the I menu but currently I just leave it off all right so moving right along we are now going to the movie shooting mode so uh Let's see, we have Mike McGee photography. So how about Mike McGee video? Again, just change it up. I did MMV because uh, why not? Uh, so you have your destination. Now, this is an interesting one. Do you actually send it to the CF Express, the card slot, or do you send it to the SD card slot? I frankly, I know it, this is the whole point of, of these advanced systems. I actually send it to the SD card slot quite a bit only because this gets blazing hot. And I have actually seen the card hot warning symbol on the back when I'm doing some of these YouTube videos. And so I just send it to the SD card. It's the same amount of time. And believe it or not, it's not any different frankly um it's not like i can't record video because it's going to the sd card so i just send it to the sd card so let's go back here now again i'm shooting fx now frame rate and this fluctuates quite a bit i have it set right now to 1080p and it's 60 frames a second I'll, i can shoot 4k we can go through here in fact frankly if you really want the highest resolution possible just set that to 4k but i just toggle that so right now i'm going with a with a um 1080p 60 frames a second just for whatever but um then we have our movie quality i always set that to high don't want it normal hey i want the highest quality movie possible um i go with the the movie format uh, that's typically for apple uh it works great i usually set this to manual anyway and i don't use auto iso when when filming a video even now white balance this is currently set to auto fine again we're getting back to the same sort of settings that i can go through um vignette control all this is pretty much the same for movies but what's nice is you can have this set to different functions so uh i really don't need it but now here's one where the auto af area mode i set that to my face because i'm doing oftentimes doing a youtube video so i want to make sure i am nice and clear and i do leave vibration reduction on and I do have the electronic VR. I found it to be fantastic. Uh, sometimes when while panning it might be a little bit odd but I really don't do much panning. I just have it on a tripod talking to the camera like a maniac and uh, it works for me. So now my microphone sensitivity you can have it a lot of people want a little bit more control and manually dial that up. I gotta be honest I just set it to auto and sometimes in post if I bring it into Final Cut Pro I may need to you know tweak a, a level or two but uh, I just leave it to auto because sometimes I'm walking around and I'll have a lav mic on this one and I'll have sort of like a different mic and it, it just it changes but um, I'm primarily a photographer. I'm not a videographer. These are just for YouTube videos, so I should actually blaze through these. Uh, I have this off. I have this off. The headphone volumes, I never monitor my audio. I don't care. I don't care about time code. So all that's off. That's just me once again. So that was the movie shooting note. All right, so now we're gonna get into the custom setting menu. Now this is where you can actually customize your camera the most. This is going to run the gamut of all the way from autofocus to controls to, to everything. So I'm gonna go through certain elements quicker than others, but I really wanna show you how I have these set up. So let's go to autofocus. Now autofocus, I'm gonna start with A1 and A2. They're somewhat similar. Now this is based on Primarily, I do back button focusing. So this allows you to choose whether you want the shutter to go off no matter what, when you release it, or if it will go off only when there is something in focus. Now, I'm a bit of a control freak, so I like to have it only when something is in focus will the shutter actually fire. So I actually set both of these, AFC and AFS, A1, A2 settings to focus, and that makes sure that something must be in focus when you actually press the trigger and it have it fire. So let's go with the focus tracking with lock on. Now, that I think defaults to three. That just means if something blocks your view, something walks in front of the frame, how quickly the camera will then reestablish focus and lock it back on when you have focus tracking on. Um, I set it to two. I think it defaults to three. It's probably not that big of a difference, but that is what I have it set to. So let's go back to, now the focus points used. Uh, maybe with the pinpoint focus, there's so many focus points that it just takes forever to get from one side of the screen to the other. So you might wanna set that to every other point, but I never do. I have this always set to all points. 
Now, store points by orientation. This is one of my favorite features. Uh, I have this on yes, and that just means when you are selecting focus and you are in a horizontal landscape orientation, you are now going to lock focus. So let's say I lock it on Mr. Bill King right here. I lock focus. Now, when I turn the camera to a vertical portrait orientation, now I'm going to have to, again, reestablish a focus point and lock that focus. But when I turn the camera back to a landscape orientation, you will see that the focus point actually jumps back to where it was when it was back in the landscape orientation. So it is remembering if you're in landscape mode or horizontal mode, that orientation, your focus point wants to be on the far right hand side. But when you're in vertical portrait mode, it, you want your focus point to be in a different spot. That is crucial. Sometimes when you do headshots, you actually shoot headshots in a landscape orientation. You want that you want the, the sides to breathe. You don't want it to be too cropped. And so I shoot headshots quite often in a landscape orientation. But then again, then you see something you like, you turn it to a portrait orientation, you want to lock that focus with the eye, especially on a single point system. So that is why it's somewhat important to have it remember whether you have the orientation up in a portrait or down in a landscape orientation to remember those focus points. All right, so that brings us to A6, autofocus activation. This is basically back button focusing. Now, as the camera defaults, it will default to the shutter and the AF on button. That means you can lock your focus by doing a half press of the shutter and then a full press will fire. Well, I don't want that half press to actually lock focus. I want the back button, the AF on button, to be the only button that actually locks that focus for me. I don't want the half press of the shutter. So I actually set this to AF on only, and that means a half press of the shutter will do nothing. It just, the shutter button for me on my particular system just fires the camera. Now we have the limit, the auto area focus area. Now this is one where I probably should change this because I really don't shoot animals. Say, do I want to do pinpoint I'm gonna say no do I want to do animals I'm gonna scroll down to animals and say no I really don't shoot animals and so I'm gonna take that off and that means there's another animal mode to take off well that means when I'm scrolling through my autofocus modes those will not be on display you can always go back into this a7 customization mode and turn them back on but it actually would be smart for me to turn this off I'm not always a smart man so I usually leave everything on simply because again I am a bit of a control freak but I probably should turn this off uh, I haven't but uh, I will revisit this and I probably will now this brings us to the focus wraparound this is another one I love um, I like a focus that wraps around the side. So all this means is that when you go to this top, let's say, and you're scrolling up to the top, instead of just stopping and hitting a wall at the top, that focus point where you have to manually go all the way back down to the bottom, it will just keep going and it will just wrap around. So that goes left to right, right to left, top down, up down, top down, whatever you want to call it, it will just wrap around the entire frame. I love it. Now we have your focus points options. Now we have manual focus mode is on or we have dynamic assist. I just leave these on. We have low light autofocus. Uh, you can have that on or off. So I actually leave this off because typically when I'm in a low light situation, that means I'm in studio. Well, if I'm in studio, I can fire up a modeling lamp. I have all sorts of options to sort of illuminate my subject without it being in a low light mode for that autofocus. So I usually have that covered. So I just prefer to have the low light autofocus mode off. Now the built-in autofocus illuminator. I have that off. Um, I'll get into a sort of a sub menu that I created when I do need that on or off because this one is kind of buried in the menus. So I have it in a separate section. I'll just get into that, but I just have this set to off. All right, so that brings us up to the control of your exposure controls. I just have those to a third. These are all pretty much basic. The easy exposure compensation, I have it on off. Is it center weighted in the area? I have it on yes, I have it on 12, okay. Uh, fine tune optimal exposure, no, don't need anything like that. Now let's get into the shutter release, okay. So we have, do you want a half press? Do you want a burst mode? I actually put it on burst mode and then I limit it later. So I just have this on on with a burst mode. So let's go down to the self timer. Well, the self timer doesn't have to be just, hey, 10 seconds and then it fires one shot. I actually have it set to the number of shots to six because I like to have a self timer. If I'm doing a self portrait, I may want to lock that focus and then have a couple of different expressions or poses. And that allows me to have it when I have a 
two second interval in between shots. So that way you get a nice range of shots, but you don't have just one to choose from after waiting 10 seconds. So you'll have a 10 second delay and then it will fire one shot, wait two seconds, fire another until all six shots are depleted. Okay, so now we have the power off. Um, I have this set to 10 seconds for playback. You know, that's if you're just playing back any sort of um, images on the back of the camera. Now the menus, I actually set this to five minutes. Uh, I don't like it when the menus uh, are a little, they, they go away too quickly and then it just takes a, a second or two. You know, this is a mirrorless camera so everything is all about the battery life, right? So I do have it set to five minutes. I haven't noticed any substantial battery life hit. Plus I have a battery, the optional battery grip attached to it, which works great. And then I have the image review set to four seconds, but that's really when I manually do it off the back of the camera. Now for the standby timer, I have this set to five minutes. That just kind of helps so that nothing just dies too quickly within one minute. One minute goes by pretty quickly and I think that's what it defaults to. But if you just have it set to one minute, um, I often find that I'm reaching for the camera after looking away for a second, especially when doing YouTube videos and then you, you find out that everything's just been shut down. Uh, I haven't noticed a huge battery drain either with setting this to five minutes, but I kind of like how it's five minutes. All right, so next up is the shooting speed mode. So I always have this to two. Now, there is a dedicated button for this on the bottom right-hand corner of the um, camera itself, and I have this set to two frames a second. I really don't do a lot of fast-paced shooting, and occasionally I'll see something I like and I wanna go pop, 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 something like that. That's why I have it set to two frames a second. Um, I really don't like it when it fires too many shots in a row. I kinda like a little bit more control, and I shoot in a slowed down, subdued kind of method. So I don't like just going machine gun style and going crack, 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 crack. I'm more of a like a count it down almost. One, two, three, pop. One, two, three, pop. I see something I like, pop. So um, I usually have it for two frames per second and that's even more than enough for me. All right, so a lot of these are just pretty much standard. I just leave them as the, the standard defaults that you can see. You can have your shutter type. I have that on auto, actually. That's, that's one where it's a mechanical shutter versus the electronic shutter. I found that the auto is just the best way to go with that. Um, I would even almost just go with the mechanical shutter if necessary, but um, you know, I set it to auto. I let the camera decide. In most cases, I think it defaults to the me mechanical shutter anyway. But um, yeah, if you have extended shutter speeds. I have that off. Limit the image area, no, that's just like your standard FX. Uh, I don't like doing the, the DX, but again, if somebody needed more range, you can, you can have that. But these are just choices that you have later on, so I could remove those choices, but it really makes no sense because I just shoot FX all the time. So um, then we have the file numbering sequence. Now this is one I actually like. I turn this off. Okay, in the past, I always had it on, and that meant when you formatted your cards, it would start at zero. Okay, and then you would shoot, you would shoot. When this was on, then the next time you shot, it kept an internal counter. So maybe you're on, you know, your fifth shoot, sixth shoot, you're now up to like 6,000. So it's M, and so the file naming would be MMP underscore 0600. So it's on 6,000, and then 7,000, and then 8,000. The problem is, you're eventually gonna hit that one shoot where it hits 9,950, and then it restarts again at 0001. So half the shots of that shoot, especially the second half, have a numbering system that is set to lower number. It's like one, starting from one. I hate all that, so I just turned it off. So that means every time I format the cards, it starts with 0001 and goes up. So yeah, you might have more similar names for files in the future, but again, I like it to avoid that conflict of a client saying, hey, wait a second, how come these are file names that start with one and they're towards the end of the shoot? Or it's just, eh, I just like having it off. So now we're back to the apply settings to live view. Now I have this once again set in my eye menu because I think it's a pretty crucial feature, especially if you do studio strobe photography. So I have it set to on so that you get to visualize and see what your shots are going to look like exposure wise before you shoot them. But in studio, you may want to have that off so that the strobes eventually fire and then you can see through what looks like a standard DSLR viewfinder. 
So your framing grid display, I have that off, uh, I don't care. Focus peaking, I actually don't even use that, that's just me, but uh, I know people love these features. I don't use them, I gotta be honest. Uh, <laughs> so view all in continuous mode, that's on. Now your flash sync speed, I have that as one 200, but you want that on the auto FP. Now what does that mean? Well, if you're ever gonna do high speed sync, let's say you have a strobe or a speed light that does high speed sync, well you wanna have that on the auto, the auto system so that it will know, and high speed sync essentially is a hack, it's a tweak, but it works. Um, and so if you just had it to one, two hundredth of a second without the auto, it's not going to work with high speed sync. So just have that set to one, two hundredth of a second, and that's your, your um, flash sync speed. Now your flash shutter speed, you have one sixtieth of a second, that's fine, just leave that as is. Uh, exposure compensation for flash, I never really mess with that. This is all just whatever. Okay, we got the auto ISO, no. Modeling flash, yeah, you can leave it on, it won't even matter. Bracketing, I don't even do bracketing, but I do like the bracketing order if I do do bracketing to start with the, the underexposed and then go to the overexposed. Um, now here is where we customize the I menu. This is big time. So I'm gonna just flip over to the customization of the I menu and go from there. All right, so here we have the customized iMenu options. Now these are the huge, important, quick access menu options that you are going to use all the time. This is probably the most vital customization menu system that you have to choose from. And if you shoot wildlife or if you shoot sports, you might have entirely different needs than me. That's okay. I'm a portrait photographer, so for my needs, I'm going to highlight some of the features and functions that I quickly access all the time. So to change any option, you just simply hit select, and then you can go through your iMenu option. So let's say we wanted to change this picture control. You just select any of them, and you hit the OK button on the back of your camera, and you have a certain number of options that you can choose from to change pretty much anything all kinds of information that you can go through and scroll through and select and change. Now, I don't wanna actually go through and change these because I have it set up pretty much how I like it. And if I go back, you can see that on screen, but I thought it'd be better if I actually show a shooting scenario to show a little bit more in detail about my particular iMenu option. All right, so now let's go to the I menu. Now this is huge. This is the I button that's on the back of the camera and you can go ahead and you can hit that here. Now this is exactly what I'm seeing through the electronic viewfinder. So I usually put the two main items or the most important items in the I menu over to the right hand side. So focusing is essentially crucial to photography. So these two are the most important that I always have right here, um, far right, top and bottom, those are the ones I go to the most. Now, uh, I do have that now mapped to the record button as well, so I can push the record button and uh, toggle through those modes, the focus modes as well as the um, area modes. But um, I like to almost have redundancy there, just in a pinch, I wanna be able to visually see that and go through my settings. So I have these set in my eye menu right here. So now, how about apply settings to live view? What is this? Well. When we're looking through an electronic viewfinder like this, one of the greatest benefits is that you get to sort of see what the shot is going to look like based on your settings even before you take it. So for example, if I take my ISO, I'm just gonna hit the ISO button here, and I'm gonna start jacking it up. I'm gonna go way too much, so it's obviously overexposed. You can see the light meter on the side is showing, wow, you're really having problems here, and it's just blown out. It looks like the end of Terminator 2, uh, but if we go all the way back down, then we'll get back to 250 and we are set. Now, what about if you're doing flash photography and you're in studio? Well, obviously it can't know that the flashes are eventually going to pop. So when you have a setting for F16 and you have your ISO set to 100, you're just gonna see a black screen. So when you go to the apply settings to live view, you can sometimes hit off. And what that means is that it's going to mimic sort of the viewfinder of a DSLR, no matter what the light settings are. It's not going to try to give you that appropriate uh, exposure compensation and sort of give you a visual of what it would look like based on your settings. It's just giving you the DSLR viewfinder type image. So now when I go to the ISO, I'm going to start jacking it up. Nothing's going to happen. Look at See, it's basically just giving you a nice positive presentation and it's just gonna show you, hey look, on the right hand side, you get to see that exposure compensation's way off the charts, but from a visual standpoint, you'll be able to see 
Well, that's crucial inside your studio because when you're in your studio, otherwise it would just be a black screen in your viewfinder because it's not going to know eventually at the exact moment you hit that shutter, flashes are gonna shoot all over and illuminate your subject. So this is one to toggle back and forth if necessary because now if you have a trigger that's advanced, the camera can automatically detect that you have a flash trigger in most cases and um, it will automatically go into the apply live view mode settings off. But if you are using a single pin, what I call dummy popper, let's say a Pocket Wizard Plus X, it just has one pin, it's not like a smart connector. Uh, it may not automatically, the camera may not automatically detect that you have, are about to fire flashes. So that's why it's good to have this one on and off, especially if you're doing portrait photography in studio with studio strobes. So now I'm gonna go through my white balance. Now you might be thinking, hey Mike, I shoot raw. Who cares about white balance? I just go into Lightroom, correct it on one of them, hit sync, it applies it to all of them, and you're good. You are correct. However, sometimes I do quite a different variety of looks with different lighting scenarios. So I might do portraits with my DIY ring light that yields a huge yellow hue and then we go outside with natural light and then there's shade and then we bring it back in and i'll shoot with some palsy buff einsteins that yield a different type of light well again from a photographer's standpoint it won't matter if you're shooting raw however from a client standpoint if you want to do any soft proofing on the back of your camera and let's say you have this now set to uh, incandescent and we're using kind of natural light they're going to say hey mike on the back of the camera, these are great headshots, but everything looks blue. And you might say, oh, it doesn't matter, I'm shooting raw. Well, I don't really like that. So I actually do toggle my white balance for every lighting scenario quite a bit, primarily for soft proofing for the client. Because when you're on a shoot with a client, you want them to be motivated, You, especially if they're not a model. They're doing headshots for their work and you fire off a couple of shots that are excellent. And uh, that is just something you wanna show them off the back of the camera. Hey, look, you look awesome. Let's let's take some more like this. Let's alter this pose quite a bit. Let's, let's tweak this. And so when you're soft proofing, you want that soft proofing on the back of the camera to look as natural as possible with lighting and color. So um, I do frequently change my white balance. And so that is why white balance is crucial for me to have that set in my eye menu. So I'm gonna put it on auto too right now. Now, the other ones I select are Bluetooth on and Wi-Fi on. Why? Why do I need these? As we're getting towards the left over here, um, these sort of have less and less importance to me. However, I remember the Wi-Fi connection. It is really hard to find turning on the Wi-Fi. It's kind of buried in the menus. Um, do I need it all the time? No. But if I use the SnapBridge application or if I'm using Bluetooth to turn it on to, do, um, to use SnapBridge as a wireless trigger, I want to quickly be able to do that. Maybe I'm doing a self-portrait and I, I'm firing a picture of my own mug. I'm going to have to fire that up and have Bluetooth on and then use SnapBridge and fire away. So sometimes you do need these for portrait photography and I rarely use them, but when I do, I don't want to have to be digging into the menu system to have these working. All right, so next up is the flash mode. I sometimes have to tweak this. Sometimes you want to fill flash. Sometimes you want no flash at all. Now, I've already remapped that button as I explained earlier, but um, it is good to just have your flash modes because you are doing portrait photography. So if you want some red eye reduction, um, you want something like that, it is good to have those options on the fly as uh, the eye menu. Next up is metering. Um, again, I kind of stick with matrix metering almost all the time, but there are some times where you maybe you want a silhouette or you want something a little different where you want that, that um, sunset in the background of somebody and then you wanna have them as a silhouette and you might wanna do some highlight weighted metering or something like that. But um, for the most part, I leave matrix metering on all the time. Now, I don't really alter these much, but I do like to, I don't know, just to visually have them at my disposal to show that the quality is raw because I don't ever really mess with this, but um, I just shoot it on raw and leave it as well as picture control. I leave it on standard. Uh, frankly, there are quite a few 
iMenu options that I don't really even need, but it is good to have more options than what you need versus less options than what you absolutely need. So I leave those on. I do have vibration reduction on, and last is the silent photography, when on occasion I might need that in a crowded setting or if I do an event or something like that on a rare occasion, uh, I may wanna have access, quick access to that. So that is how I set up my iMenu. All right, so next up we have the OK button. Now the OK button, this is a good one because I actually have it set to the reset button. So what that does is whenever you push the OK mode while your eye is through the viewfinder and you're shooting, it resets that focus mode to dead center. So if you're doing single point square, that square is going to go dead center back to the center of the screen. Um, that's helpful when you want to readjust or you have something really in one corner and you want to go back to the center. Uh, oftentimes it's center weighted anyway and maybe an eye is pretty close to the center of the viewfinder and so if you just hit the OK button and then find the eye really quickly, recompose, lock focus, bam, it works really well. So have this set to reset. Then we can go to shutter speed and aperture lock. I just have these off. Then we have the customized command dials. So you can have reverse rotation. You can set it to go all the way up to like 50 in advance when you click one of the dials. Um, I just have it set to 10. This is pretty much basic. Um, then we have the release button to use the dial. I have that set to off. You have your reverse indicators. Okay, reverse frame. All this is set to off. Now this, uh, this is crucial for me because I actually do have the MB N11 battery grip. This thing is phenomenal. I love this battery grip. I could literally do a separate video on just the battery grip because it is a quote unquote smart battery grip, but I have my function buttons just to have that, that AF lock. The AF on button basically does back button focusing and it sets that. Now my function button, you can do all kinds of things here. I just set, have it set to the reset on release, but um, there's all kinds of stuff you can also set for that additional button that they have on the battery grip. But um, primarily I really use it just for the back button focusing and the focus point menu selectors that you have just the same way um, that you can have it in a vertical orientation when you're shooting portraits. All right, so that brings us to the movie modes. So now once you go into the movie modes, you can realize, hey, your customized iMenu options that work great for stills don't have to be identical for movies. So you can completely customize these as well for movie modes. Now in particular, white balance is one for the movie mode where you definitely want to have that. It's a little harder than just a raw image to correct in post. And you might have your, your microphone sensitivity, things like that, that you wouldn't care to need in still photography. So I have my customized movie modes set to these options. All right, so I'm gonna go back out here and I'm gonna to go to your custom controls. And again, each one of these buttons, when you're in the movie mode, can be set to a completely different function. That's one thing I love about this. So you can have like your subject tracking is function two. That's more important and my white balance is very important for me, again, in movie mode to ensure that I have the correct white balance since it's harder to correct. You have a little bit less of the options to, to customize, but not too bad. You still have some and I just have it set to do the exact same functions that you see here. All right, so I'm gonna go back out and we're gonna to go to the OK button. Again, that just resets to that center focus point. Now we're gonna to go to the AM speed is zero, tracking sensitivity, and then we have the highlight display. I just have that off and I go to the, again, battery grip buttons can be different for the movie modes, but I just have those straight up set to off and it's just an autofocus lock because I'm not gonna to be toggling things. All right, so that brings us out to the little wrench icon. So now these are your standard setup menus. I don't even think you can customize these, can you? Um, well, you have viewfinder brightness and things like that. Uh, viewfinder brightness, I just have it set to auto. Uh, in most cases, that's fine. Scroll through here, control panel brightness, blah, blah, blah. Okay, yeah, clean. I mean, this is all pretty much standard. Now, copyright information, this is always kind of a fun one, is that you should enter in your particular information. I enter in my name and my website. But what's also kind of interesting is that when you sell your camera and you say reset to the defaults, I've noticed that Nikon actually doesn't reset this information. So you could sell your camera and uh, your name and website might be on somebody else's camera if they don't dig deep into the menu. So just something to keep in mind about that I've seen in the past, but um, yeah. So we have your little HDMI options, blah, 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 beep. Everything is pretty standard here. Now, 
HDMI is actually, there's an interesting one here if you were trying to use this as a webcam where you can export like clean video. Um, that's something to keep in mind. But for the most part, all this is just standard. I just go through here. And then when you connect to a PC or smart device, this is where those Wi-Fi connections are built in. See, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi are kind of buried into these smart device menus, which is why I specifically have it in my iMenu. Do I use it? No, not really, but um, I can use it with uh, the app SnapBridge and uh, it, they're just hard to find. So rather than digging through all that, similar to the battery info, that's why I just have it as number one on the My Menu option and on F1, just because it's just easier to access from here. Um, all this stuff, USB power delivery, pretty much, pretty much all this is fine. Now, if you ever update the firmware on your camera, one thing I remember that I've seen people ask about is like, when you, if you have two camera slots, well, you just want to make sure if you put it on the SD card and you have the primary set to the other slot, then it's not going to find it. And you might think, hey, how come I can't update my firmware? Currently, I am on firmware, what, 1.2? Um, so anyway, you just want to, if you have the SD card, just take the other card out and just put the SD card if you're going to load it onto your SD card, just so that when you're updating firmware, the camera defaults to the only card which it can access, and then it will give you that option to, hey, update the firmware. Uh, just something to keep in mind. Now, uh, the retouch menu, I don't go through any of this stuff because I don't retouch anything in camera. Um, I haven't touched it. And then this is the My Menu, but this is why I like programming this to the Function 1 button as the top and then function two for the full my menu. So um, I often need to format the memory card. I do it before every shoot. So I need that quick access to the form format memory card. Now file number sequencing, sometimes I like to turn that on or turn it off or let it run. Um, and again, all these little options that you can just add any item. And so if you select add item, now you have all these choices that remember we went through all these setups and custom menus, you can just start scrolling through and you can add some little menu here to that particular menu item and then you can have quick access to it so you're not having to find it all the time. So that's how I have that. I'm gonna hit the back button here and I'm gonna go back here and pretty much that is it. So hopefully that helped and uh, let's go back to the studio. All right, so there you have it. That's sort of a detailed look at the way I set up my camera and some of the menu systems and uh, Hopefully you learned something or hopefully you just got something out of this video. Um, now, uh, if you set up your camera a different way, that's actually a good thing. That's cool. Set it up how you want it. Um, I just wanted to set it, show you how I set things up on my end. Um, and maybe you can try out one or two of the little items uh, and uh, see if it works for you. So uh, hopefully that works. Uh, and if you like this video, please feel free to give it a thumbs up. Uh, if you like this video and maybe you want to check out my other ones, check them out and feel free to subscribe. That was a thumbs up, but feel free to subscribe in case you want to see any more videos that I make and uh, hopefully you enjoyed it and uh, thanks for watching.